Like, the first beat I made, I knew this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It definitely wasn't easy. This is Murder Beats, and that's 5,000 people. But how did we get here? This story starts back in 2012. Murdered in this shit. In 2012, Shane Lindstrom is 17 years old, and he lives in a small town called Fort Erie in Ontario, Canada. Although Shane didn't grow up around a lot of hip hop, his dad played guitar, and this would influence him to learn the drums. At this moment, he had no idea how much his dad's musical influence would have on his future. While in high school, Shane's friend showed him a program called FL Studio. I was like, this shit's kind of fire. I was like making beats, they were complete garbage. And he would later trade his drum set for a copy of the program. He would stay home that summer teaching himself how to make beats and studying old Lex Luger videos on the internet. He decided to go with the name Young Murda. Initially, he had plans of making beats for friends who freestyled, as well as local Toronto rappers. Unlike traditional producers, Shane didn't wait to perfect his craft. He immediately started marking himself regardless of how good his beats were. So like people people at first were telling me, oh like wait till your beats are better to like start getting placements. So I was like, yo, fuck this shit. I was like three months into making beats, sending people beats on Twitter. He landed his first official placement. It was with a Bay Area artist named YB the Rockstar, or now known as Rich Rocka. Yeah. In 2013, a song he produced for Rocky Diamonds would get a remix featuring Soldier Boy, and this would be his first mainstream artist to rap on a murder beat. Feeling confident with this little bit of success was the driving factor in deciding not to go to college and pursuing beats full time after high school. I was gonna go to school for business because I want, I want to be, I like money. Even though this may sound like the perfect story so far, you have to understand that sometimes early on success can be misleading. Murder landed his first two placements within months of making beats, which is not typical, and that wouldn't be a good representation of how hard the next few years would be. His patience and dedication would be tested. Seeing the rise of popularity in drill music, which at the time was at its peak, Murder decided to target the heart of it all, Chicago artists. Sticking to what worked best for him, he continued to hit people up on Twitter. He managed to get a hold of a member of Chief Keef's GBE crew. He built a relationship with him for a while. As much as he enjoyed marketing himself online, he didn't want to get stuck just being an online producer. He knew that that was only half the job, and if he was going to build something long term, he needed to try to meet people face to face. He pressed the issue and eventually broke the news to his mom that he was going to be taking a trip to Chicago to meet them, specifically the Wild 100s. While in Chicago, he met Chief Keef and most of the GBE crew, and over the next few months, he would work with Keef's cousin, Fredo Santana, Capo, Trey Savage, as well as other Chicago legends. After feeling accomplished of working with some of Chicago's biggest artists, he decided to set his eyes on another city where things were heating up. I need to get to like Atlanta. I need to like find a way to like get into like the Atlanta scene and like the rap scene over there. One day Murder was on live mixtapes listening to music, but more importantly, looking for new artists to work with. He came across a mixtape by an upcoming Atlanta group named The Migos. After listening to their music, he admits he didn't even know if he loved it, but he knew for sure that their very different rap style had a massive potential. After failed attempts to get a hold of them directly, he hit up a rapper named Skippa De Flippa, who was less popular, but always around the Migos. He sent a pack of 10 beats to Skippa and told him, I'm gonna give you a pack of beats. Just let Quavo and take off, hear these beats. His offset was locked up at the time. Needless to say, they loved his beats. Once again though, he found himself in a situation. He could keep the relationship online or try meeting face to face. Just after meeting the Migos, they would drop their viral song Versace, and this would be the first time most of the world would hear Migos. Although the song was produced by Zaytoven Beats and not Murda, this would still work in his favor because he had just started building a friendship with them. Murda was a little nervous though. He was still getting to know them and he didn't know if they were going to forget about him after blowing up. Shortly after, the Migos would fly him out to Atlanta. This would become a regular thing. He would live with them for a couple months at a time, working non-stop in the studio. They even started taking him on tours and bringing him on stage with them. They started to claim him as the QC the label producer. Murder on the beat, so it's not nice. 2015 would be the most impactful year in Murder's life. The key word being impactful because not everything that happened this year would be positive, but all of it would shape the person he is today. This would be the year he would lose his father. Having to deal with such a loss could easily have been a breaking point for anyone. Had he chosen to deal with things differently, he could have easily given up 
or taking a break. But knowing his dad was such an influence on him musically, he pushed through the pain and determined to make a name for himself. At the same time this is going on, Murdo admits that even though he had built a pretty good resume, he still had to struggle for money. I wasn't getting paid for my work, I was just building my brand. I knew my worth and I wanted to start getting paid. And Selling tight beats online through PayPal and MoneyGram was the only way he made ends meet, regardless what people around him may have thought, knowing he had a number of successful songs with Migos and GBE. His patience was being tested to the max at this point. But finally, after years of work, it paid off. The Migos would drop their album, Young Rich Nation, which featured a song, Pipe It Up, produced by Murda. This would debut at number 38 on the Billboard 100. This would finally bring his name to mainstream hip-hop. Blogs and interviews followed the success of Pipe It Up, and soon after, everyone in the game wanted a Murda beat. I ain't really finna tell y'all how to get away with murder and shit. All the buzz he could have hoped for, Murder was ready to prove everyone he was here to stay. Although Murder and the Migos now had a family like Bond, he wanted to also make sure he branded himself. It's great being known as the Migos producer, but he wanted to make sure the world knew who he was. He managed to land some of the biggest songs of his career this year, working with Drake, which was a huge milestone seeing that they're both from Canada, as well as Gucci Mane, Travis Scott. Murder was the hottest new producer in the game, and he would make a lot of new friends this year. One of them being a Drake affiliate named Baka. Baka is important to Murder's story because he would be the first person to give Murder an updated producer tag. This tag represents a new beginning for Murder. At this point, he had already proved his worth in the game, and all he needed to do was stay consistent to keep his spot on the throne. But this was easy for Murder. I mean, I would argue he has always been one of the most consistent producers out there. Looking at his track record, it's only ever been up for Murder. From 2017 to present, there's no excuse for not knowing who Murder Beats is. He's worked with just about everyone in hip-hop and rap, even earning himself a Grammy nomination, his own hot sauce, and he became a DJ. Murder Beats' story is unique in a lot of ways, but the truth is, Murder is around today because of his consistency and his ability to market himself as a brand. He made a point early on not to only be online, but to also make those impactful face-to-face -face impressions. And these would be the foundations of his success. And this is what he would want you to hear. If you have a passion for what you do, don't listen to everyone around you. Cause like a lot of people are gonna tell you, if you're like, yo, I wanna be a basketball player. Everyone's gonna be like, man, you can't be a basketball player. How many people from where we're from became basketball players? You know what I mean? But like the sky's the limit. Like I'm from a town of 30,000 people. Everyone told me I couldn't do what I do because my skin color and just because no one makes it out of where I'm from. So you just gotta like find God or like just find your purpose of being here and just crying hard thanks for watching consider liking and subscribing for more content i am planning on doing a whole series let me know down below who you'd like to see next